Hey everyone, in today's video, I am sharing five mistakes elementary school teachers often make when teaching math. Now, I have done some similar videos in the past. I have mistakes teachers make when teaching phonics, as well as mistakes teachers make when doing writing workshop in the classroom. Um, that video specifically is going to talk about the workshop model and some things they can do to make it more structured, but I wanted to do one for math as well. So in this video, I'm going to share each of the five mistakes teachers commonly make, and I'm going to share how you can fix that mistake so you don't do it going further. If you're ready to hear what these mistakes are, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's get started. All right, before I dive into the five specific mistakes teachers often make, I do wanna talk about one kind of general one, and that is something I actually studied in my math class that I took a year or two ago uh, during grad school, and it's all about math anxiety. There was a recent study that was done just a few years ago with teachers all over the world talking about their math anxiety and how math anxiety is actually a real thing, and when a teacher or a parent has anxiety around math or thinks that they aren't good at math, it can often get passed along to students or their own children. Math is kind of this funny thing where, you know, if somebody is not a great reader, you don't often hear people saying, oh, I'm not very good at reading. Oh, I'm horrible at reading. I am not a reader. But on the flip side, you'll often hear many adults easily and quickly identify themselves as not good at math. They'll say, oh, I'm not a math person. No, 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 I'm horrible at math. Like, you hear it all the time, right? And it kind of gives this idea to our students and our kids that there are math people and there are not math people. Now, while many students may be a little more analytical and maybe might grasp onto some math concepts easier than others, there's no such thing as like math people and not math people. So I could do a whole video on that, but I just want to kind of get that uh, out there first. And that as a math teacher, as anyone teaching math to younger students, you want to make sure you're not kind of passing that along. You want to learn about the math that you are going to be teaching, make sure you understand it before you pass it on to your students. I'd also love to know your thoughts on that. Do you often find that people, you know, say that they're not good at math? Do you think you are a math person or not a math person? Let me know down in the comments. All right, mistake number one that teachers often make when teaching math is they focus on the procedural over the conceptual. Now, I have talked about procedural and conceptual knowledge many times in the past. In fact, over the summer, I did an entire series on how to teach different topics uh, conceptually. And the biggest difference here is with procedural math, essentially, you are teaching students a strategy, a procedure to solve something to get the right answer. But if you are trying to teach them more conceptually, then you're actually teaching them why that method works and they have a greater understanding of what they're actually performing, what they're actually doing to get the right answer. To illustrate this really quickly at the K-1 level, if I were teaching students how to compare numbers, I could teach them a procedure and I could teach them to go ahead and use a number line. I could say, okay, find the two numbers on the number line, the one that is closer to, you know, the 10 or the 20 or the numbers that are getting bigger, that's the bigger number. And the smaller one is going to be closer to the zero. So if I'm teaching them how to compare numbers and they have eight uh, and then like a circle to either put the greater than or less than sign and a six, that's a procedure they could use. And that's an accurate one. They'll get the right answer if they follow those steps. But the question is, does that really teach students how to compare those numbers and what the eight and the six really mean and how we actually know that eight is bigger than six and six is less than eight? The answer is no. That's why when we're teaching this to our students, we start with manipulatives, right? If we have the number eight, we are gathering eight different cubes and we're looking at it. Then we're gathering six different cubes and we're looking at that and we're comparing them. So students actually understand what those concepts mean, what they look like, they can see it, they can visualize it, they get it. Now it should be noted that we definitely want to still teach our students procedures like that. Um, it's a great strategy for them to have, to be able to understand that number line, right? But instead of just seeing the number line and knowing bigger numbers this way, smaller numbers this way, now they see the number line and they know why those numbers are there, right? They know why that represents more and more and more, and these represent less, less, less as we get closer to zero. It's the same with the standard algorithm, right? Your students in second and third grade, they are going to learn how to carry the one and 
and to line up the numbers by place value. But hopefully they're not learning just that procedure. Hopefully they have been taught before that the conceptual reasons why we do that. They have used base 10 blocks. They understand unitizing and they understand why we need to regroup when we have to. When we focus our lessons first on the conceptual, our students have a much deeper understanding of these math skills, and especially at the K1 and 2 levels, that deeper understanding is going to help them so much more as they go on to more difficult math. So to fix mistake number one, you really want to unpack each standard you're trying to teach to your students. Think what are the main takeaways? What do my students really need to understand here? And how can we teach that using concrete manipulatives and illustrations or representations of these things before we just teach them a quick fix? Now I mentioned last summer I made quite a few math videos where I teach the conceptual understanding of something compared to the procedural. So I will link those down in the description below in case you want to check those out. All right, mistake number two teachers often make when teaching math is they do too much telling and not enough exploring. Now in tons of my math videos, I have talked about the CRA framework and how we want to move our students from concrete understanding to representational understanding before we move to abstract, right? It's a framework that we kind of move along for our students. Now many different math curriculums have you heavily focused on the R first, the representational. They will introduce fractions by, you know, showing pictures and drawing them on the board for your students, but your students aren't using any manipulatives to explore this concept. Some programs when teaching addition will actually start with the abstract. They will have two plus two on the board and then they'll show students how to solve that. Maybe with some pictures so they'll add a little bit of that R, that representational in there, but they're entirely skipping over the concrete. With each and every math skill you teach to your students, you want to make sure they have plenty of time exploring that concept with hands-on tools. And realistically, unless your students can show that they understand that skill with manipulatives, they shouldn't really move on to drawing pictures or solving it abstractly just yet. By giving them plenty of time to explore the topic, get their hands dirty with it, and actually feel it and create it, they're going to have a much deeper understanding of what they're trying to learn. So to fix mistake number two is even if you follow a boxed curriculum, take a look at the skill you're introducing to your students and make sure before you have them start solving problems on the board or you know on their papers by drawing, see how you can fit some hands-on manipulatives in there first. Give them time to explore the topic and you also should be explicitly teaching them how to do this skill with manipulatives. So if we're teaching how to add, I don't just say, okay, uh, show me two plus two, I actually show them with manipulatives, here I take two blocks, here I take another two blocks, when I put them together, I have four blocks. Okay, let me see you do it. So not only are they exploring, but you're also explicitly teaching them how to do just that. If you need more ideas for concrete learning on different math skills, just check out my entire math playlist, find whatever you're teaching, and I probably have a video on it. Um, if I don't, let me know down in the comments and I'll make one for you. Okay, mistake number three teachers often make when teaching math is teaching too many strategies at one time. Now here I'm specifically thinking of those addition and subtraction strategies, and I am guilty of this. I know when I would teach my students how to add, we would definitely have that concrete practice, but then I want to kind of throw it all at them, and I'm like, here's all these other ways that you can add, right? We have many strategies we teach our students and that we want to teach our students so that they become fluent in addition and subtraction. We have doubles facts, we have adding with zero, we have doubles plus one, we have counting on, we have using a number line, we have using manipulation, in your fingers. There's so many different strategies we want to teach our students, but oftentimes we kind of make a little addition strategies anchor chart and we're like, hey, here's a strategy. We write it down, show it to them, move on to the next. And I understand this thinking because not only does it take a long time to teach each strategy, but also uh, we want our students to kind of find the one that works best for them, right? That's why we teach them all these different strategies so they can understand them and then kind of pick the one that works best. But what we're not doing is we're not giving our students enough time to actually explore that strategy. John Van de Waal is actually the author of this book right here, Elementary and Middle School Mathematics, Teaching Developmentally. Um, he's also the author of many other books, but he talks a lot about the importance of making sure students try out a strategy for at least a few days. Um, before they move on to another one. Because only your top, top, top students, your gifted students, if any, are going to actually retain how to use a strategy after learning it one time, even if you add it to your prettiest anchor chart. 
And I know I said that sarcastically, but trust me, I used to do the exact same thing. I would teach them how to do a strategy, add it to the chart. Next day, we're learning a new one. Let's move on, let's see. And I would basically tell them, okay, find what sticks, right? But sure, one might stick out a little more, but they would have a chance to use all those others if you gave them more opportunities to use them. And also on top of that, some of those strategies are only going to be useful in certain scenarios. Like counting on, for example, you don't want your students to use that strategy necessarily if they're adding five plus six. There are other strategies like doubles plus one that stick out better, that make it a little faster for them to actually go ahead and compute, and that just make a lot more sense. And teaching students when those strategies best come into play is also great practice. So to fix mistake number three is when you are teaching addition and subtraction strategies, take your time and really let your students figure out each one. Again, even with these addition and subtraction strategies, walk through that CRA framework. How can we show what doubles look like? How can we show doubles plus one? Then how can we show it in pictures before we move to abstract? This is going to help your students really understand this concept more, and it also really develops their addition and subtraction fluency when they're better able to understand all those strategies. And that, of course, is only going to help them when they continue to third, fourth, fifth grade, and so on. All right, mistake number four teachers often make is they skip the math talk. Now I have done many videos on the past about the importance of math talks in a classroom, how to do math talks, uh, some phrases we should use during math talks, different types of math talks, I have a bunch of them. I've also spent the last year hopping around with the conference Get Your Teach On, where I do a session all about math strategies to develop number sense. Um, and one of the first math strategies I teach is how to use an effective math talk in your classroom. Now from talking to teachers, I hear one of two different things about a math talk. Number one, they think, yes, a math talk is really easy, simple, okay, got it, good, Susan, we don't need to hear more. Number two, sometimes I'll often hear that math talks are a little intimidating or they don't know what type of problem to put up there with their students or how to really run one effectively or they try to put up a problem and nobody's actually talking during the math talk. So I'd like to know from you, are you one or two? Do you do math talks often? Are they going well? Let me know down in the comments or number two is it a little intimidating and your students aren't really getting it you don't know how to facilitate it let me know even if you are a number two and you feel a little intimidated by it or just not going as well as you would have hoped please don't give up because a math talk is so important for your students conceptual understanding of numbers and remember back to mistake number one where we teach procedural over conceptual a math talk is a great way for students to understand those concepts, for them to get used to talking about math, right? We talk a lot in our reading blocks about stories. We talk a lot in writing and social studies and science. We want our students to be able to talk about math and get used to talking about math as well. One of the biggest benefits I have found through doing math talks with my students is it really helps students become flexible with numbers and with their math strategies. They get to take what we're learning during our math block and kind of start to apply it pretty quickly. Now, I'm not gonna do a big long segment here on how to do a math talk just because I've done so many videos on them in the past. Here are a few and I will link down some of the ones I think you should get started with. I'll link them down in the description if you want to know more, but just know that a math talk does not have to be long. It can be a quick amount of time that you throw up a problem on the board, something your students have already worked on. Maybe you worked on it a month ago, maybe you worked on it yesterday, but you want to throw it up on the board, have students solve it, and then you want to kind of guide them to explain their reasoning. That's a very brief gist, but like I said, if you want to know more, I'll link it down below. And mistake number five teachers often make when teaching math is they forget why we're teaching these skills. Now listen, getting students to understand numbers, teaching them how to add, subtract, understand place value, measure, fractions, it is a big task, right? We have a ton we need to teach in a limited amount of time and we wanna make sure we do it right. We wanna make sure we're not making all these mistakes that I'm talking about, but we don't want to forget why we're teaching these concepts. And the biggest way to help with that is to make sure you keep bringing in some real life scenarios that your students will have to solve using this math you're teaching them. Now listen, I feel like as elementary school teachers, we kind of have an advantage in that. Um, I know there are plenty of geometry and algebra skills that I learned in high school that I can't remember ever applying in real life, at least like specifically. But guess what, in K through two, we don't teach that. We teach our students how to add, 
how to subtract, how to understand what a number is, how to actually measure something. These are very real life skills that we use often and we want our students to know that. Just a few weeks ago I did this video on measurement right here talking about how to most effectively teach measurement in our classrooms and one of the things I brought up is that oftentimes when we're teaching measurement, this is like a mistake we sometimes make, um, we kind of focus the whole thing on grab some cubes and go measure that shoe. Grab some cubes and go measure that bookshelf to see if they can do it accurately. But in real life, we're not really, you know, we're not even grabbing a ruler and just measuring one thing, right? We are measuring a desk to see if it fits on a wall. We're measuring a picture to see if it's going to fit in a space that we want it to go. We are actually measuring something to compare it to another measurement is what's actually happening. And that is something that when we're teaching measurement, we often leave out. So that was kind of a side note, but again, in that video, I mentioned that we want to bring these real life scenarios to our students. Not only do real life scenarios make a topic a lot more engaging for our students, but it really helps them connect why we're learning this. Thankfully, this can be a pretty easy mistake to fix. Now, you don't need to incorporate a real life activity or connection every single day in your unit, but take one unit as a whole, like let's say subtraction, and try to think of how you can sprinkle some real life scenarios and word problems into to your teaching. For example, with subtraction, I might bring in a bag of 25 stickers and I might say, oh, hey everybody, I bought these wonderful stickers for you guys um, and I wanna pass them out, but oh, I actually don't know if I have enough. So I have 25, uh, how many kids do we have in the class and will I have enough? How do I know? How can we solve this problem? I don't wanna start passing out the stickers and we don't have enough and people are left out, right? And with your class in just a few minutes, you can show them how we can take 25, we can subtract the number of kids and we can be sure that we have enough or we can recognize that we don't. Simple little activities like that are not only memorable to your students, but again, they also connect those concepts a little bit more. All right, so just for a quick recap, the five mistakes teachers often make when teaching math are they focus on the procedural instead of the conceptual. They don't spend enough time with manipulatives exploring. They focus on too many strategies at one time. They skip their math talk and they forget why we teach each skill. I hope in this video you recognized even if you do make any of these mistakes, even if you make all of the mistakes, I gave you some ways to kind of fix it going forward. And if you want to know any more, please just let me know down in the comments. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, so please give it a thumbs up if you did. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video, which right now I am doing videos on Thursday and Sunday mornings. See you in the next one, bye.